Okay, Michael here again, and this time we're going to be looking at the specific things that you need to consider when writing your assignment, looking at some of the academic um, limitations and some of the boundaries that you should stay within. You're looking at, well they're on the screen so you can see them, but those areas. You might find that you're comfortable with one or two of those areas, so if you want, just skip through and then look into the next piece. Uh, you might find that actually some of it's quite useful, even though you think you're quite good or... or um, skilled in that area. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to look at is referencing. Now, in terms of referencing, I've put some examples up there, and there's the issue of both in text referencing and in the reference list. Now, for the purpose of this, I'm going to look at the correct way to do it in text for the PSC program, and that's a bit of an asterisk that I'm using there because if you're on sports science as well as PSC, you do it a slightly different way in that they use APA and we use a version of Harvard referencing. So just think about that and consider that. Effectively, uh, you've got to reference in text, okay? To get a good grade, we expect to see that you're refer referring to other people's work. So what I've done here to start off with is, I've just put Armour 2011 in brackets, and so go on to say that they suggest. Now that's how we would do it at the start of a sentence. At the start of a sentence, all you need to do is, the author author's name, and the date, and then what, and they suggest, and move on from there. Really, quite simple. But the date must always be in brackets. It's a common mistake that actually I see quite regularly that people don't put the date in brackets, and I think that's because they've seen other formats of text uh, referencing that do that. But that's all you need to do for the form of Harvard when you're working on PSE. Um, now, the other form of referencing that we're looking at is at the end of a reference, okay? And if you look here, I've written a sentence. Um, you can read the sentence about coaching pedagogy, if you like. Um, okay? Now, if you just take a look at the actual reference there, you see that what I've stated is inside the brackets and at the end of the sentence, okay? Now, multiple people have stated the same thing. So, both the Department for Education and Coates and Vickerman have both suggested about, you know, giving student voice is a good way to challenge barriers to participation. Um, so if you look here, I've put the um, Department for Education, or the DfE, comma, 2012, and Coates and Vickerman, comma, 2010, and that's all in one bracket. And I've decided to put that at the end of the sentence. Now, one of the things to look at um, is if you look you can see that the bracket is before the full stop. Okay, So make sure the bracket is always before the full stop. What a lot of people do is they put a full stop here and then leave that in brackets. Now effectively what that's done is that has made DFE 2012 and Coates and Vickerman 2010 a sentence on its own. So make sure that if you're referencing at the end of a sentence that you make sure that, that it's in the sentence and that the full stop comes after the brackets. Okay, that's just something to think about, but it's a real common mistake that I see a lot. Now you're probably going to ask, right, well, which one should I use? Should I use a reference at the start of the sentence? That seems quite easy. Or should I use a reference at the end of the sentence? Now, actually, I would recommend using a variety of both. What kind of happens is if I start every sentence with Armour 2011 suggests, Coates and Vickerman 2010 suggests, Green 2008 suggests. Um, it becomes very repetitive and very listy. Okay, um, So if every time you reference, you reference at the start of the text, it makes your reading become, your writing read in a way which is quite listy and maybe takes out that individual interpretation of somebody else's work. So my recommendation there is that to use a variety of both because if you um, start a sentence with Armour suggests or what that does show is it shows that actually the point you're making is a paraphrasing of somebody else's work as opposed to you know as opposed to relying on your own thoughts and feelings and emotions and so on so where possible, I think you should use some references at the start of the sentence, 
and some references at the end of the sentence. Now, one of the things that actually I haven't included here, but you want to think about is quoting as well. Okay, and my recommendation is always to use your own words and paraphrase as opposed to quoting, and that's something that I think will be drummed into a lot of you. But if you are going to use a quote, only ever use a few. I would say in a 2,000 word assignment, you probably don't want to use more than three or four. And I would suggest only using like one, maybe two sentences of a quote. As soon as that quote goes over two lines, it takes away from your own understanding, interpretations and feeling and becomes just you copying and pasting other people's ideas in there. So my recommendation is that you avoid doing that, okay? Um, right, so what have we got here? Okay, so I've just got here your reference list outside of text, and actually you can see that I've made a bit of an error. I'm just going to see if you can spot what that is. Okay, so firstly, my error is actually the Department for Education reference should come apart above the Evans reference, all right? And that's simply because the reference list should be in alphabetical order. Quite simple, but that is how it should be, okay? So, as you can see, we've got Armour, then we've got Coates, then we've got the Department for Education, and then we've got Evans, okay? So that's the first thing. Now, the second thing is, if you look, that all of the references, at the start, we always start with the name of the author and then their initial. All you need is the author's surname first, followed by a comma, and then their initial. If there's more than one author, like there is in the case of Coates and Vickerman, you follow that up with a comma, um, and then you go on to list the other authors. So if you can see there, Evans, Rich, and Davies, um, there's commas in between them. Okay, um, So... Now, actually, again, you can see a couple of mistakes here. So, firstly, this comma doesn't really need to be here, okay? Because you've got Coach J and Vickerman P. So, we don't really need that comma, so we can take that out, okay? Now, here, it should be Evans, comma, Rich, comma, and Davis B, okay? So, it's just simple little things that you need to do to get them correct. Now, this will take some time, and you'll get it right over the next couple of years. But the one, the thing that you really want to think about is think of it as a skill. I've had the conversation with a few, few of you. The first time you kicked a ball, the first time you went over a hurdle, the first time that you threw, um, you know, you, you threw a rugby ball or whatever. You weren't very good at it. And this is the same thing. Referencing is something which is learned and developed. But if you can get the small, if you can get the main bits right, the small intricacies will come. Okay, so surname, comma, initial, if it's the only author, full stop. Okay, now secondly, if you have a look, the placing of the full stop is really important. Now, a lot of people forget this full stop here after the date, because it doesn't seem to make much sense. You just had a full stop, but you really should keep that full stop in there. And the reason for that is that if you think of a sentence... Every time a new piece of information comes, or a new sentence, you'd have a full stop. And that's the same for a reference. So as you can see here, we've got name, full stop. Then you've got date, full stop. And then we move on to the title of the publication. Now, here, what you can see is actually... just amend that. That the title of the publication and the information about that publication is all one um, that is all one cent uh, is all one piece of information there's no full stops okay so if you look there you will see that sport pedagogy an introduction for teaching and coaching that's in italics that's because this is a book so with a book the title of the book is in italics okay um, and then you will see that there's a comma between Harlow and Prentice Hall where the book was printed. Now actually here, this at the moment is in italics, which again is a mistake. If you go back to the formatting of the text, you would see that this shouldn't be in italics because it's not the name of the book. This should be in a regular format. Okay. So the only bit which is in italics is the title, 
because that is, okay, that is a significant piece of information and this bit here doesn't need to be in italics, okay, so that would be uh, just in a regular font style. Okay, so those are the key points to look at. Um, now, I'm not going to go through every one with you. Up here, this is a book. Down here, you can see that this is a journal article. The difference with a journal article is clearly that actually it's the name of the journal in italics. Okay, so you can see there that that's the name of the journal in italics as opposed to the name of the article because that's the publication. That's the important thing that you need to find. Um, and then the minor details again go back to not being in italics. I don't expect you to get this straight away. I don't expect you to have this sussed. What I'm going to show you is this should be on every module. Um, if you go onto the module page, you should see that at the top of the page uh, that there is a referencing booklet. And if you click on that referencing booklet, then that will have how to reference every different type of document. Okay, So don't get 100% sort of wound up on just what I'm saying in the video. You can go back to the referencing document and it does highlight for you the different types there. Um, now ultimately, if you get your work done earlier, the quicker you can go back and check, have I done this right? Have I done this right? Okay. Um, so just think about that and have use that to your help. All right. Um, so that's just what I'm going to say about that. Um, the articles that are referenced here are all articles that have been used for 4006, and they are all on the 4006 homepage. So make the most of accessing those and using those. Also, you, without you know being too simplistic, we've done these for you. They're gimmies. Use them, okay? The one here with the Department for Education, that's the husband and peers paper that you guys uh, used before. And that's because it's not, like I said before, it's a policy document as opposed to being a academic piece of work. But it's something which is very useful. Okay. So that's referencing. That's for you guys to get your head round. Now, hopefully, that's something we'll have sussed pretty soon. Now, this is a common mistake, and I just want to go on to this, that quite a lot of people use. Okay, And what I've got here is this concept of writing in the third person and writing in the first person. Um, there's a picture of a baby crying. Why is there a picture of a baby crying? Because that is how members of staff feel when they read a sentence like the one below. I believe that by allowing girls to choose what outfits they wear, the wrong wear, I should state, um, then they are taking what well, then they are taking part in PE. This will promote a healthier self-image. Right. Now, firstly, that's a really badly written sentence with a couple of mistakes. So let's get our where's where and where's right. So that should be where, like that, and that should be when. Um, so straight away. There is a evidence that proofreading needs to occur. Okay, so that's a poor sentence. I believe that by allowing girls to choose what outfits they wear when they are taking part in PE, this will promote a healthier self-image. Right. Now, why why is that wrong in academic practice? For a number, it's wrong for a number of reasons. Okay, but the main reason I'm going going to go into is that actually. Mainly, if you write in the first person, it gets you drawn into being, oh, I think this, well, I think that, and it becomes a bit of a narrative, as opposed to being an academic way of writing. Now, traditionally, academia was very scientific, um, you know, mathematics, um, physics, they were the main things that people would go and study, and the sciences dominated academia. Now, it's not the case now, and you will see some academic papers written using I. Okay, but, and there is a big but, what we believe is that when you're writing on the PSC program, generally you should avoid I unless the assessment is asking for a personal reflection or is about your, you know, your experiences. Um, so if it was a, a journal or a reflection and that was the assignment, 
But generally, the reason that you don't use I is because it stops you writing in quite an academic way. You can see the same sentence has just been rephrased below. One strategy that may have a positive impact upon girls to develop a more healthy self-image is to allow them to choose what they wear in PE. Same sentence, pretty much. Same sentiments, without a doubt. But we've gone from saying, I believe, to one strategy that may have a positive impact. So... I believe is sort of got these um, personal values attached to it and is less neutral, is less objective. One strategy that may is suggesting that, well, this isn't exactly the right answer. And we're stating things in a fairly similar way, but we're now removing our personal bias away from it. And that's what you guys have got to think about is by writing in the third person, like the ones below, A, you will have me and the other members of staff jumping for joy, but B, you take away that personal bias, and you take away that narrativeness, and it makes it read a lot easier, okay? So that's something that I would encourage that you guys did. Well, you'll, you'll lose marks by not doing that, so try and engage with that, okay? Now, this is the next bugbear that I have, if you like, um, and it's about using connectives. So... Make sure you link to the title and you link to what's gone before. I've got two um, statements here. And the first one has no connective. So it's just imagine that it's starting a paragraph. Start of the paragraph, Coates and Vickerman highlight how sometimes the presence of a TA in a PE setting can isolate individuals with SEND from their peers. Okay. I just want you to have a think about that statement. All right. Now, I would suggest it's not necessarily a bad statement, but it kind of just jumps straight in with Coates and Vickerman's ideas. And that's kind of my beef with it, if you like. That, A, I don't really know what's gone before. B, it may not connect with other stuff. But, you know, you're just throwing Coates and Vickerman's ideas straight into the melting pot. And that could be a bit of an issue, if you like. Okay? that you're just going, bang, in we go, and there's no connection to the title, so I don't really know what the assignment's about, and I always think you should link back to the title, and B, there's not really any chance to um, link to what has gone before in terms of the writing. So if you're going to start a paragraph, I would recommend sort of trying to ease the reader into it and connecting. So if you look at the sentence below, and if you just want to pause the video and take two seconds to have a look at that. Hopefully what you can see by pausing the video and having a look at the sentence below is that we've just sort of cautioned the transition from the paragraph before. So let's take that the paragraph before was about the positive impact of teaching assistants. Okay? And the sentence below says, although teaching assistants often have a positive impact upon the experience of individuals with SEND, well... If the paragraph before was about that positive impact, we've seen that there's a connection and a link. This is sometimes not the case in a PE setting. Sorry, in PE settings. Okay. And then we've linked into Coates and Vickermans. Um, so that's kind of using a connective sentence to, rather than having three, four different themes that don't connect, you've all of a sudden got a fluency and a flow from one theme to another. Now, the other difference in the Coates and Vickerman sentence, which you might see, that isn't in the one above, is that this term here, when it says about descriptive pedagogy coming in. So, all we've said is that sometimes the presence of a TA in a PE setting can isolate individuals in the first sentence. In the sentence below, we've gone that sometimes the presence of a TA can promote discriminative pedagogy by isolating individuals with SEND from their peers. All we've effectively done there is linked back to the question by using the phrase discriminative pedagogy. Okay? And just framing that there. So just by throwing that phrase in, not only have we cushioned from what has gone before, and the sentence is possibly looking at teaching assistants having a positive impact, or the paragraph that has looked at teaching assistants having a positive impact, we've linked back to the question as well by using the phrase discriminative pedagogy because we're looking at the experience of individuals and that phrase pedagogy being in there has allowed that to happen 
Okay. So that's in terms of using connectives. I'm not going to go through all the different connectives that you can use, but to write well and to write fluently, it's something that I would encourage you to use. Okay. Now, the next bit I'm going to ask you to do is look at not being descriptive and emotive. What I'd like you to do again is just pause the video and have a look at what's bad about this statement here. Okay, so just pause the video and have a look at what's bad about the statement here. Okay, so hopefully you've paused the video and hopefully you've highlighted a few things. For me, I think there are a number of things that make this a statement which is mm, not very good at degree level. Okay, so sorry, I've just clicked off that. But if you have a look, what for me isn't very good about this statement at degree level? Okay, the first thing I'm going to pick up on is here. A journal article by Coates and Vickerman. Now this is something that I see done quite a lot. Right. For me, this sentence isn't really needed. Or this piece of information here isn't really needed. A journal article by Coates and Vickerman. You don't have to tell me that it's a journal article. Okay? That's something that you see quite a lot that people do. But you don't need that bit of information. It's not relevant. It's not... By having that information there, does it add anything else to your assignment? No, it doesn't. It's no different than by stating Coates and Vickerman 2008. So what you're telling me here is a journal article by Coates and Vickerman talks about why TAs might have a negative impact on the experience of, uh, um, of PE for pupils with SEND. Well, it's just very descriptive. Very, very descriptive. You're saying this journal article has said that this might be the case. A, a journal article by Coates and Vickerman is descriptive. B, you're just saying, oh, this is what the journal article is maybe saying. All right? But you're not using that to formulate an argument. That's what I, where I'm going with this. Is That information is in there, but you can make the argument without putting it in there. Okay. So that's the first thing. Now, if you have a look at the sentence below, you're going to see that actually... Again, I would argue that it kind of repeats what's gone above. Okay, so Coates and Vickerman state that the presence of a TA can have a horrendous and grotesque impact on the learning of pupils with SEND. But is this really the case? For me, that is a sentence that could be developed significantly. Firstly, I've repeated the sentence opening from the line before in quick succession. So I start the first sentence with Coates and Vickerman 2008 state, and then... Coates and Vickerman, um, sorry, a journal article by Coates and Vickerman 2008. Coates and Vickerman 2008 state, in quick succession, I've used the same reference and the same sentence opening. And for the reader, that becomes really repetitive and it becomes really, really listy. Um, and that's something that if you want to get the better grades, you should avoid doing. You should start to think about varying up your sentence openings. Okay, So try to open them differently. Even though you've got a journal article by Coates and Vickerman, and then you've gone Coates and Vickerman, it still reads like I'm just just using these guys' thoughts. Okay, so that's the first thing. This repetition here is something that I think should be avoided. And the next thing about this sentence um, that I'm going to pick up is we've got some really emotive language here. If I talk about it being emotive, I would say it's quite. You know, it's there to make an impact. It's quite sensationalist. It's the sort of thing that you would read in the Daily Mail or the Sun. The presence of a TA can have a horrendous and grotesque impact. You know, those are very vivid terms. But that we talk about being biased, we talk about being neutral. It's not really good academic writing to use those. Um, if we just take them out, can have a negative impact upon the learning of pupils to send, that would be fine, but the terms horrendous and grotesque are really making people feel, you know, really strong emotions, and that isn't your job. Your job is to provide a balanced argument. So that's something I want you to think about. Um, now I've followed that up with one of my pet hates, but is this really the case? Now I know why people are doing it. Some people have thrown a rhetorical question in there, to try and show a bit of criticality. 
well, Coates and Vickerman say, say this, but is this really the case? Right, okay. But do you need that statement? You know, that rhetorical question is kind of put in there for you to feel like you're being critical, but it's something that I would always rec I would recommend taking out because you, you're going to answer that question for us in a way, okay? Um, and so you don't need it in there, and it's kind of just a, mm, I need to fill a few words, I'll throw a rhetorical question in. So, I would recommend that that is deleted. Personally, I would avoid using rhetorical questions. They're quite nice for creative writing and stirring up emotions, but again, you're not trying to stir up emotions. You're not working for the tabloid press, and that's something that you want to think about. Now, if we have a look at the next sentence, okay. The TA's presence will isolate the student. This is because they are working with the TA and not learning to communicate with others in their class. Okay. Well, what do we feel about that? Again, that sentence for me, at first glimpses, you're like, yeah, that kind of makes sense. But let, let's be critical about that sentence. The TA's presence will isolate the student. That's a very bold and strong statement. If you'd put, may isolate the student, then we'd see that actually you're suggesting that it's not always the case and that might be neutral. But by saying it will isolate the student, what you're effectively saying is, yes, I have this certain claim for knowledge, and you're not being balanced, you are almost going back to this grotesque and horrendous impact, if you like. You're saying this will happen, this is always the case. But can you speak for every TA? No, you can't. Can you speak for everyone with a disability? No, you can't. And again, sometimes TAs are used in a very effective manner. So, in this scenario, the term will is a very poor term there. Okay, now secondly, if we go on, this is because they are working with the TA and not learning to communicate with others in their class. Again, it's very matter of fact. Rather than this is, this may be because they are, would be a better way of putting it. But if you look at what we've got here, actually, this sentence and the one below are very, very descriptive. And you've used a lot of words there, which you don't necessarily have to use. P involves lots of social interaction and teamwork, and by working with a TA, the student won't be able to benefit from this. Well, did you really need to use those words? Did you really need to go into that much depth? My suggestion would be no. I think you can write that in a far more succinct manner. Okay. Now, finally, finishing with a big generalisation, this means that using TA is bad pedagogy. Well, no, it doesn't, because we can't, you know, we can't just say that that is the experience for all. So, actually, this paragraph here isn't a very good paragraph at all, because it's, it's emotive, it's descriptive, and it's making huge generalisations. So try and avoid these things in your writing. Try and avoid the things that I've got there because we're not trying to stir up people's emotions. We're not trying to start a revolution. What we're trying to do is get people to think about a topic area. I think, well, this might be the case or this might not be the case. But the other thing I would suggest is that you will lose a reader as soon as you start making generalisations. So just going back to the sentence we saw below, um, and we saw seen this before, actually makes pretty much the same points but in a far more succinct way. All of the same points are in there. The idea of bad pedagogy or discriminative pedagogy is in one line rather than being in a whole sentence. Okay. Sometimes the presence can promote. Sometimes the presence can promote that. Okay, that's clear. And by isolating individuals from their peers, we've said everything that was said before, but in a much shorter and far more neutral way of writing. Okay, so that's something that I want you to think about doing. Now the last thing I'm going to get onto is the sources, and I think you guys have had this sort of through the nose, but it's something that I'm just going to um, come back to and, and try and promote. The preferable sources, the better sources to use. Firstly, strongest source you can use is a peer-reviewed journal. Okay, and if you have a look on SimsCap, if we go onto the page for um, PSC 4006. If we go down, we would see that the level 2 and level 3 readings are journal articles. So the paper here by Tynan is a journal article. 
um, and the, um, some of these papers here, level two and three, tend to be journal articles. Okay, as we go on, as the weeks go on, we start to use more journal articles than we are books. Okay, so that's the first thing. Next would come chapters in books. Okay, and you get different types of books, but let's go back to um, let's go back to the Armour example. If we look early on, the introductory reading for PSE 4006 was what is sports pedagogy and why study it. Now that's a chapter in the book on sport pedagogy. Why do those tend to be better to use than just a general chapter in the book? Well, the reason for that is these are often, often actually um, almost paraphrasing the journal articles that have been published and have been peer reviewed. So ultimately, I think they are, you know, you can still use them and they are still good to use. Um, journal articles often seem to be better. But I would recommend that, you know, yeah, a chapter in a book is really good to use. It's a good um, thing to use, especially if there are multiple authors. I think the books where there are multiple authors and different people write different chapters in books, really, really quite robust sources in a first year of a university course, I think is a good thing that you can work at. Okay, and the last thing is books in general. So sometimes one author will write the whole book. That's not to say that what he's saying is any less profound, but sometimes um, you'll find that that is just that they've gone out there and written the book and it isn't necessarily based upon other journals and articles they've, they've written. So that's why I'd recommend using chapters in books over books that are purely um, written by one author. So chapters in books written by multiple authors and have editors, I think, are stronger than just books. But again, if you use any of those, fine, fantastic, they're academic sources, but possibly try to use more journal articles, more of these, less of these where possible. Okay, now finally, please, please, please avoid and don't use these. Websites, when can you use websites? Citing policy, yeah, you can use them citing policy. Um, if it is a governing body's website, so if it was someone like Sporting Equals, if it was someone like Sport England, yes, you can use their website. Um, but generally, otherwise, avoid using them. Um, magazines, newspapers, too emotive, not based on theory, not based on research. Just, just stay away from them. Okay. Um, right, like that's kind of it. I don't think there's anything else for me really to add to this video. I know I've kind of rushed through the last couple of areas, but I hope that you've used this and you can find it useful. Um, Again, any questions, get in contact, drop me an email, and we can go from there. Okay, thank you very much.